Yeah, just a, a real pleasure to introduce Glenn Tolman here today. So give him a hand for, for this. Fantastic. Looking Thanks, forward. Danny. Yeah. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, uh, thanks for spending a little time with me today. And Danny, thanks for the introduction. Danny told me right before we started, he gave me two pieces of advice. He said, we used to be competitors, but today I'll be introducing you. So I always worry about that. And then he said, you can talk as long as you want today, but after 20 minutes, they're going to cut your mic. So I'm going to try to keep my comments to just under that. Um, the talk today is called The End of the Beginning. And it really is about what's coming in healthcare because, as Danny mentioned, I was fortunate to run one of the largest electronic prescribing companies, practice management companies, and electronic health record companies in the country. And we made great progress. In fact, particularly in electronic prescribing, when I left, we were doing more than half a billion electronic prescriptions just at all scripts alone let alone the rest of the industry. So we had made great progress there, and yet we knew that we were really just at the beginning of what needed to happen with electronic health records. And that is today, electronic health records are really data repositories. They're not yet information systems. And what we spent is 10 years laying the foundation for what was going to happen, whereas a lot of people were already exhausted and they were already saying, OK, now we're done, right? We have these electronic health records. And the answer was, no, in fact, now we're just about to get started on the fun part, the meaningful part, the part that will allow us to make a real difference. So that's what I want to talk about today. Um, what Danny didn't mention, and I actually appreciate it, but usually people pick out the fact that um, I was a social anthropologist by training. I spent a year living with the Amish. And the first question is, what's a social anthropologist doing running software companies? And it's taken me about 20 years to figure that out. And the real answer is that it's not about the software. And I think all of us are learning that today. It's really about the experience. It's about what change you can make. Because the only reason we use software, after all, is because it changes something. It changes our experience. It makes something different. And the companies that we've been fortunate to build really have three things in common. One is they do use technology, um, and that could be software, and that could be process technology, to change some kind of process, something people are doing, ideally something that's broken. Second, we're very mission-driven. So it's a focus on healthcare, and today it's a focus on what we call the intelligent, connected health consumer. We'll talk a little bit about that. And last but not least, we tend to be contrarian. So when everybody's going one direction, we tend to go the other direction because we think that's a good indication of where the future is going to be. So we'll talk a little bit about that. And I want to begin with this idea of planning. Because by definition, planning in most organizations has to do with what you can plan for, what you understand. And really, the biggest part of planning today is what you don't understand what you can't imagine. And I was speaking recently to a large pharmaceutical organization, and we were talking about strategic planning. And so they said, can you give us some scenarios? And I said, well, here's a scenario. Imagine in your largest category, your most profitable category, that your competitor comes out and says, we're going to give all our medications away for free. And if we don't improve behavior, you don't have to pay us. But if we do, we want all those savings, or half of those savings. And so they kind of laughed, and I said, no, no, I'm serious, because that's exactly what's going to happen. In the future, people are going to pay for performance. They aren't going to care whether you have a great med. What matters is, are people taking it? And what matters even more is, is it having the intended effect? Is it making them better? And better is defined not only by clinical improvement, but by cost reduction. And so again, the challenge today that I think we face in healthcare is that more and more people are planning for a future that's going to change dramatically, and they have no idea about it. And in some cases, they aren't even worried about it. So I meet with a lot of companies, and they simply aren't worried about what's coming. Just like taxi drivers in Chicago at the Taxi Commission, which had been there for more than 100 years, and when Uber arrived, they laughed, and they said, We've been doing this for 100 years. We've transitioned from horses to cars. And there's never been a time when we didn't own what happens on the roads here. 
when we didn't own what happens on the road. Six months later, our mayor signed a deal that said you put your regional headquarters here and you can have Uber. And it was over. It was just over that quickly. The same is true for cardiologists in certain areas who've been told that their patients can go anywhere they want, but if they want to have their care reimbursed, they have to go to a particular medical organization. And so again, this change is coming rapidly. So there's a great quote by Kafka that, that I like a lot, in a fight between you and the world, bet on the world. And what Kafka didn't say is the world actually doesn't care so it doesn't care if you're offended by these changes or anything else. It's simply driving these changes. And all of us have to deal with these changes. So what are the changes? Well, we know about regulation. And whether you love Obamacare or you hate Obamacare, it doesn't really matter because the change is embedded there. Um, most of those changes are going to be in the next administration, whatever administration that might be. And in fact, most people in the industry say they'd rather have stability of knowing what they're dealing with than some kind of constant change. And of course, then there's new technology that will accelerate all of this. There's the business model revolution, which we already talked about, and that's a movement from fee for service to paying for actual value. And then last but not least, there's this tricky animal called the consumer what we call the health consumer. And he or she acts very differently than someone who's being told what to do. And in fact, if we look at this new consumer-centric model, what's really fascinating is that it's not just about the convenience aspect, which many of us focus on and we love. So whether it's doctors on demand or whether it's well care centers or the like, this is about what people will do if they actually have two critical elements. One element is if they have perfect information or near perfect information. And the other element is if they're actually paying for what they buy. And we've already seen this in a number of areas. In fact, in Chicago, one of the places where I live, there's these wonderful poster boards that are up now. And it says, if you're paying more than $600 for your MRI, you need your head examined. And guess what? Somebody did a survey of consumers, and they're on most of the bus, you know, bus terminals, bus waiting uh, areas. And somebody did a survey, and they asked people what they think MRIs cost. And more than half of the people said $600. And then they said, what would you do if somebody tells you it's more than $600? And half of those people said, I'd look somewhere else. So think about how quickly that consumer behavior can get changed especially if they're the ones paying. Now in the past, when we talked about managed care, it was interesting because we, we thought that managed care meant someone else was going to manage our care. And what we found out recently is managed care really means that we have to manage our own care. But today the challenge is we don't have great tools to do that. But those tools are coming. Much of what you see here in this incredible conference is about all those tools that are coming. They aren't yet at scale, but they're getting there quickly. And I'll, I'll talk just a bit about you know, my sense of what needs to happen as organizations, what we need to do to accelerate that scale, um, and particularly to accelerate that scale before others do. Now, I wrote an article not too long ago. It was in Forbes, and it turned out, Forbes was very happy with it. It was one of the most hit on articles in Forbes Online. And so that was great news, but then they told me that 60% of the people didn't like what I said. So that was a little discouraging, and it turns out that it, it wasn't really what I said. Because the title, the subtitle was, let's stop trying to force consumers to engage in their health care. And people thought I meant that people shouldn't be engaged in their health care. And that's not at all what I meant. What I said was, when we surveyed people with chronic conditions, what they told us was they didn't want to engage in their health care. They didn't want to spend one more minute on their high cholesterol, one more minute thinking about their diet or their diabetes or any other ailment they had. They wanted to live their life. And we should stop giving them solutions that cause them to do more work. We ought to figure out how do we use technology, how do we give them solutions that leave them alone and let them live their life. 
And so that's this whole push toward engagement really needs to be a push toward empowerment. And that is, how do we empower people to focus them on allowing them to live their time? So how do you translate that? So you look at a solution and it says, does it take our health consumers, our members, our patients, more time or less time? If it's more time, you should put an X across it. Second, does it take our providers? Does it give them more data or better information or even better than that answers? And number three, from a risk perspective, does it cost more or less? Now, I know this is tough in healthcare. And that is, how do you make something cost less than it used to cost? Because we're used to it going up. But that's the challenge. And we've done it in so many other areas. And we have to do it here. And that's not by risk share shifting. That's not by saying, well, how to make it cost less? We'll just shift it all to the consumers. Um, that's not what we're talking about. So how do you be innovative? And the other piece of it is, how do you make it so people want to use it? And I'll tell you an interesting, kind of a fun little story. My, my youngest son was playing a role-playing game, an RPG. And I walked down, and I wanted to be a good dad. And so I said, hey, why don't I sit down, and I'll learn the game with you? So he said, great. And I said, where are the directions? And so he looked at me, and he said, dad, nothing smart has directions anymore. So think about that. Nothing smart has directions. The idea that he would think of picking up anything and not starting to use it, that you would have to somehow read and learn about it, that's gone. So now all of us actually think that too. We don't get our phones and go take a course. Um, nobody taught a billion people or billions of people to use Google. Um, and in fact, even if you type it in and you get the spelling wrong, it's going to correct it. So we have to think about healthcare that way. And it's very different than what we've been doing. And we also have to think differently about chronic conditions. And that's where the current company that I'm privileged to be CEO of is focused. It's focused on empowering people with chronic conditions to live better lives. So why is that? Why do we have to think about it differently? Well, if you try to solve the chronic condition problem, whether it be any chronic condition, and you do that under the current scenario, you're going to try to get doctors in the middle of it. And the challenge is, as you can see from this chart, even if you spent five hours a year face to face with your doctor, that's 0.1% of the year. So what we're saying to people is 99.9% .9 of the time, you're on your own to manage your disease. And how many people spend five hours face to face with their physician? Not a lot. So, so again, what this says is we have to look differently. And in particular in diabetes where we're focused, and I use this as kind of a case study, um, you have more than 30 million people with diabetes and it's growing, type one and type two. So the idea that every one of them could spend five hours with their physician, can't do the math. You can't make enough physicians fast enough. You surely can't make enough endocrinologists fast enough. So we have to use it differently. And paired with that, we have consumers who are now thinking that everything in healthcare ought to look just like everything that they use in the rest of their day. And so the idea that they're going to be patient about healthcare, that they're going to go to a waiting room to spend their money, all these ideas are outdated. And we have to look at our models not as another healthcare provider down the road, but we have to look at our models as what's happening in the best in class categories and compare that to how we use technology in healthcare. And so what are the four principles that we believe in? One, it has to be personal. Two, it has to be context aware. It has to know where and when you want the information. Three, it has to be so simple it requires no training. And four, it has to be actionable. Because nobody wants to get information that they have to remember. Nobody wants to get information that needs to be translated for them. And people want information in the right context. Let me give you an example. For those of you who drove here, imagine if your phone rang right now and someone said, we can be there in five minutes to fix your flat tire. So most of you would feel, would you feel great about that call? Yes or no? Raise your hand if you feel great. Get a call. You can be there in five minutes to fix a flat tire that you don't have. Anybody feel? Okay, you kind of say, who gave you my phone number? But if you had a flat tire, 
And they got the context right. Those exact same words, that exact same call, you'd think it was magic. You'd say, so let me get this straight. So while I'm sitting in here, you can fix my flat tire and make that whole problem go away as if it never happened. That's, that's magical. And what you wouldn't ask is how much it cost. You'd say, just do it, because I'm busy and I'm going along. And that's what context aware means. Context aware means we want to call somebody exactly when they need help. Again, today, many of our doctor visits are focused on people coming in because they're told to come in. Get your quarterly checkup. What a waste of physician time. What we ought to be doing is focusing on the people who need care. So how do we do that? So we get that information in advance, we understand the population, and then we target people who need care. A very different model. And many of the doctors say they'd love to get paid more money, um, but they're, they're not able to code patients up. Well, of course, because they're not seeing the right patients. If you see a sick patient, you're going to get a lot more money and spend maybe the same amount of time. So how do we do that? Well, that's where we think technology can come in. We think technology can come in because we think if you put information in the hands of consumers, you can change the game. And again, let me use an example from Livongo. So what is Livongo? It's three things, very simple. It's a connected meter, so it has a cellular chip and a glucometer. People with diabetes check their blood sugar. Goes up to a cloud. The cloud does three things to make it simple. One, sends back messages. Your blood sugar is really high. Drink three glasses of water. Walk for 15 minutes. Check again in 30 minutes. Your blood sugar is low. Maybe drink a glass of fruit juice. Check again in 30 minutes. 80% of the people who get those messages comply. 80%. Why? Context sensitive, very personal, simple to do, and they understand it. 80%. And they see it right on a screen, right there, right when they need it. Second, we share that information with their care team. Now, their care team could be a physician, but the reality is it's generally a son or a daughter taking care of an elderly parent, a mother or father taking care of a young child, a spouse, somebody else who can be there to help. And last but not least, we ship that information to 24 by 7 certified diabetes educators, and those people call within 60 to 90 seconds. And what do they say? They say, we're looking at your reading, we're looking at your history, how can we help? And that has been shown to reduce overall cost, unnecessary hospitalizations, and the like. So again, how do you use technology to change the process? That's really what we're talking about. So I want to conclude with a final um, idea. And that is that being, having been on many different sides as both a venture investor through our venture fund, as a CEO running a number of companies, as we go out to talk to people, one of the biggest challenges is this, that um, my partner likes to say that most organizations have more pilots than United Airlines. Okay? Everybody is out there and they say, hey, we, we have this charge, we need to innovate. And so we're going to innovate by piloting 10 different things. And I'm going to suggest to you that that's not what innovation is about. So innovation is about, to quote an old friend of mine and Jeff Sauls, sometimes you have to leap before you look. Innovation is about going forward and embracing change. And if it doesn't work, of course you're going to stop it. But the idea of piloting things, the idea of studying these things endlessly you know, is not going to work in the future. And my suggestion is innovation really begins by doing something. And what we ought to be doing is pick your organizations, pick your technologies, and go forward and make them work. And if you don't make them work, at minimum, you're going to learn a lot. And that learning is going to be the basis of how we change healthcare. But we can't afford to wait any longer. And that's really the message, I think, to take away. It's not about technology. It's about the leadership of all the people in this room at this conference to make a difference and make things happen. And I think we can. Thank you very much.
Sometimes we miss our cues, I'm sorry. Uh, but actually, I was talking to our next speaker, so it was, uh, it was worthwhile. Um, all right, so now it's my pleasure, after that great talk, to introduce another great uh, presentation. So I'm, gonna be int I'm introducing uh, Adam Landman, who's giving the next keynote. And Adam Landman is the Chief Information Officer, the CIO, which uh, in his case does not stand for Career is Over, at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital uh, Healthcare, an Assistant professor, uh, professor of Emergency Medicine, Harvard Medical School. Now, before I give you the title of his keynote, I'll just say, in looking through his bio, it's nice to find interesting things uh, that he did. So I think what's, what's really most impressive here is that, he, uh, that Adam led a three-year, $7 million custom software development project to move the Brigham and Women's uh, Emergency Department clinicians from paper base to electronic documentation. So that's pretty impressive, $7 million three-year project. Um, and then over the past three years, he helped oversee the implementation of EPIC, which is an EPIC job, and uh, several critical uh, laboratory information systems. Um, he's also even designed mobile apps, which is really cool. Now, the reason that he's particularly well qualified to talk about what he's talking about today is that he created the Brigham and Women's Hospital Digital Health Innovation Group to spur the hospital's use of digital technology as well as facilitate appropriate use of digital tools by clinicians, innovators, and researchers. So I think that's really cool, and that uniquely qualifies him to give this keynote, which is called, and I was skeptical, and I'm still skeptical, but he's gonna convince me otherwise, reducing barriers, developing pathways to accelerate digital health innovation at academic medical centers. So give it up for Adam, Adam Lenman. <laughs> convince me, convince Thank me. You. <laughs> Thank you, really, uh, Danny, for the really nice uh, introduction. And if I seem distracted, it's because we're actually doing an epic upgrade tonight and uh, really uh, making sure that our hospital will be running uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, but thanks so much for the opportunity to talk with you today. Um, one quick disclosure, um, I'm a senior editor at Ranked Health. It's a nonprofit uh, organization that comes out of MIT Hacking Medicine that does, uh, evaluates digital health apps. Um, there's no uh, content influence in this presentation, but, but wanted to uh, be transparent. Um, I am really excited, as I think probably many of you are, it is an incredible time to be in healthcare. As we shift from fee-for-service um, to value-based care, and we start focusing on population health management, on care coordination. And what's common across all of this is the need for information. And it's now expected that we have complete longitudinal digital information on our patients. But what we're really moving to beyond just having that information is being able to predict um, what's going to happen to our patients based off of that data. And if we can predict what's gonna happen, can we prevent um, that from happening? And at the same time, as um, all of you have appreciated, the digital health opportunity is growing by leaps and bounds. And um, as you walk through the exhibitor space, I'm really blown away by, by some of the innovations today. Seeing, um, I'm an emergency physician and I use a gigantic ultrasound machine um, and now seeing that that can be done on a tablet with one small probe or seeing the innovative patient engagement solutions that can be used in uh, acute care hospitals or a full um, body sensor that can display um, a person's emotions outwardly. Um, so tons of incredible solutions and a very large um, marketplace. But at the same time, we may be at a peak of inflated expectations with digital health. And we need to ensure that these digital health solutions are actually addressing real patient um, and hospital needs, really addressing pain points. And we can think about that as whether or not they address the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's triple aim. Do they help improve overall patient health and population health? Do they help uh, reduce um, costs, make healthcare more efficient? And do they help improve um, safety and efficiency? And it's really hard to achieve all three of these, but we, need, we hope and expect that when we're implementing digital health solutions that they at least address one or more of them. And where there's another gap is that there is lack of a robust um, catalog of evidence for digital health um, innovations. We need to build out that validated evidence. And beyond the evidence, we also need to look at the workflows. Will these, solutions, will these solutions work for our patients and their caregivers? And will they work for our healthcare providers and other staff that need to use them? And this is where I really think there's an opportunity for academic medical centers to help accelerate digital health innovation. 
As you all know, academic medical centers seek to provide the highest level, um, highest quality and safest um, clinical care. We also seek to uh, provide service to the communities in which the hospitals are located. And uniquely, academic medical centers also train the next generation of healthcare providers and leaders. And most importantly, academic medical centers have a huge role in biomedical research and discovery. And this is where I think that academic medical centers can be harnessed to accelerate digital health innovation, to be involved in the design, the testing, um, and the validation of digital health solutions. And I know many of you may be sitting back and, and sort of what Danny said of, it's really hard to work with academic medical centers. And that's um, definitely true for outsiders as well as those inside an academic medical center. Um, we, we move slowly, these are large organizations, and that can be um, very difficult when you're a digital health startup and you're coming up with new ideas, iterating, uh, releasing new products, potentially on a, on a time scale of months, and it may take, uh, excuse me, on a time scale of weeks, and it may take months um, or even years to sign agreements, to get um, IRB approvals, to move forward with collaborations at academic medical centers. It can also be really difficult to work with academic medical centers. Um, we have to agree on uh, terms. There are information security reviews uh, that, that need to happen. And finally, um, academic medical centers are deeply rooted in biomedical uh, research and development, but much of that history is in basic science. Um, and there may not be incentives for um, faculty at academic medical centers to engage in health systems delivery research and digital health research. At the Brigham and Women's Hospital, which is an academic medical center in Boston, we have a long tradition of research and discovery um, in both basic biomedical sciences as well as um, uh, health information technologies. Um, and in 2013, the Brigham launched the Brigham Innovation Hub, or iHub. Um, and right now, the iHub is exclusively dedicated to digital health. Overall vision of the iHub is to foster the use of digital health innovation collaborations, and ultimately translating successful digital health solutions to patients and to improve the healthcare delivery system. And there are three areas of focus that we're working on. The first is digital infrastructure to make it easier to work with the Brigham. The second is focusing efforts on hospital strategic priorities. And the third is for internal hospital innovators um, creating processes and support mechanisms to facilitate their use of digital health innovation tools. And so I'm now going to walk through each of these um, and provide some real world examples of um, what we're doing. The first is infrastructure, and the key here is that we're trying to create scalable platforms to facilitate innovation, to make it easier and more efficient for outside folks and internal um, Brigham staff to do digital health innovation. And I'm gonna share two things. Um, one is how we've created a pathway to simplify the administrative burden, and the second is how we're building a platform for researchers to use mobile health tools. So there are more and more researchers, even some basic science researchers, that are getting interested in using digital health tools. Many of them are not familiar with digital health tools. They've never tried to use them in their research projects. Um, this is a new world for them. And they quickly realize that it, there, are, there are rules and processes in place, um, and they are largely in place so that hospitals can protect their patients, um, their providers, and the institution, um, and ensure that it's a safe uh, study or pilot. Um, but these can be onerous. They can take months to years to get through. And so we've created the iHub API, um, Advise, Prepare, and Implement. And this is really a human API that's designed to facilitate um, getting digital health systems approved and piloted and going at the Brigham. We start, as with all IS governance processes, we start with a very brief um, intake form. But then we adopt some practices from the Institutional Review Board, and we actually assemble a group of experts. And those experts include folks from our contracting area, from our research computing, from infrastructure, from some of our data services, um, our information and security and groups, and our health information management groups. And we also invite the investigator that's proposing the project, as well as any collaborators, any corporate collaborators or others. And we come together in a group setting and we discuss the project and we discuss what's needed, and we put together a follow-up checklist 
for what needs to happen. So do they need a contract? Do they need a BAA? Um, does it need an information security review? And we list who's responsible, and we ensure that those connections are met, and we track that, um, and once that's met, then the, the pilot is given a, um, a green light. Um, we've been doing this for about uh, two years. Uh, we've had 50 uh, pilots go through, and we have uh, shortened the cycle time where it used to take you know, nine months or a year to get some of these projects approved to a number of weeks. It's been very, very well received by investigators as well as um, industry. Another example of infrastructure that we're building is we've quickly realized that uh, researchers want to use uh, patient-reported outcomes. Um, for example, Yvonne Lee, a rheumatologist in our institution, had a um, grant-funded project um, to look at patient-reported pain, uh, mental health um, uh, characteristics, um, as well as activity, and look to see if that information was shared with healthcare providers, how that would influence the prescribing of disease-modifying um, agents. Similarly, Bob Rudin, a researcher at RAND uh, and the Brigham Department of Medicine, um, had some funding to look at um, patient-reported outcomes for asthma. So how would patient reported activity levels, um, breathing symptoms, how would that influence their management of asthma? Both of these investigators had um, partners with industry, um, and um, they had a lot of trouble executing the contracts. And that could be because they were working with early stage companies that uh, actually pivoted, and they were, the companies were no longer um, focused in the same area, and so it wasn't a good alignment anymore. And it could have also been because of our um, internal processes um, contracting languages around end user licensing agreements, IP, that stalled these projects for months. And so we realized that both of these projects and researchers were trying to do something similar. We pulled them together. Uh, we provided um, expert resource, resources um, from the iHub, um, Josie Elias, who um, helped uh, bring in an independent developer, and we custom built a platform to do patient reported outcomes uh, for our researchers. And what you're seeing here is um, on the left, you're seeing uh, an, actually an iOS um, and Android uh, native app uh, that, that is the patient facing side and allows the patients to receive survey questions and respond to them. And the right side is a back-end dashboard that allows the research assistants, the primary principal investigators, and the clinicians to see the responses, um, act on abnormal values. Um, and I'm pleased to say that these two uh, projects are uh, about, or these studies are about to commence. Um, and we are really excited for additional researchers to now come on this platform to build out features and to have this as a very research focused, meets researchers' needs, meets um, security requirements to support these projects going forward. The second area of focus for the iHub is on hospital needs driven innovation. And our over overarching goal here is to identify key pain points that the hospital is experiencing and then also understand the incredible wealth of digital solutions that are out there from events like this and meeting, uh, meeting all of you through Mass Challenge um, and, uh, and their programs and platforms around digital health. Um, and try to bring those two together and see if we can find matches. In some cases, we find a tool that is mature and we are ready to, certain, to, to purchase. In others, there's an opportunity for us to help enhance the product and customize the product and we can enter a co-development relationship. And then in others, there is no solution, and we might build it. So I want to share with you um, a few examples. The other thing I want to identify is hospitals have an infinite number of challenges, <clears throat> and um, there's an infinite number of digital health solutions that can help us address them. And so we have really focused on the hospital strategic priorities, which you're seeing across the boxes up top. Those are the Brigham strategic priorities and values um, for the year. The iHub could actually help all of those strategic priorities. And so over the next year, we are focusing on three, patient engagement and experience, active asset management, which is the efficient use of our um, very valuable resources, such as our operating rooms or our clinicians, and trans translational research acceleration. And so here's an example of something that we custom built. Nick Farrow, who is the director of the Brigham uh, Burn Center, um, came to me and described a problem where he wanted to increase the appropriate use of the Brigham's Burn Center. And we are one of two burn centers in the state of Massachusetts. And um, you know, we talked about the goal of increasing appropriate transfers, so patients that go to outside hospitals outside of the Brigham that see a critically injured uh, burn patient need to be able to quickly transfer the patient to the Brigham. And in other cases, the patient is stable, and they just need a way to, to, follow, to set up outpatient follow-up. 
And so with the help of Mark Zhang, one of our clinical informatics fellows, um, and the ADK group, uh, a software development firm, we custom built an app. This app has two functions. The first is to provide 24-7 um, access to a, a, an attending burn physician to our community and region um, of healthcare providers. As you can see in the slide on the left, they hit one button to page the physician. They fill out a couple of fields in the middle of um, what type of burn does the patient have, and then they'll get called back by an attending burn physician to discuss whether the patient needs to be emergently transferred to the Brigham for the OR or for the intensive care unit, or whether the patient can be managed as an outpatient and have follow-up. The second feature of the app is a reference tool. We, as an emergency physician, I don't see burn patients that often, um, and they can be complex to manage. And so we provide information on um, burn se severity classifications, as you're seeing here, or fluid resuscitation guidelines, and make it very easy to retrieve that information. We are currently piloting this at a couple of hospitals. Um, it is available right now to download on the iOS store as well as the um, Google Play store, and we are looking forward to evaluating the success of, uh, of this application. Another example that I want to give uh, is um, in the hospital, as many of you may know, if you've been a patient or a visitor in a hospital, it's difficult to find your way around. Um, and we recognize that digital technologies may help uh, patients and uh, family members uh, locate their loved ones or make it to their appointments or to their meetings in the hospital. Um, and so, um, again, led by the iHub team of Bev Hardy um, and Josie Elias, we have um, actually uh, found a solution, a commercial solution that was mature, and we are in the process of negotiating a contract to put in a solution that will provide um, web-based turn-by-turn directions to patients and family members, kiosks throughout the hospital where patients can self-serve uh, directions, and they'll also be able to get directions on their mobile devices, and we hope this will improve the patient experience for the patients at Brigham and Women's Healthcare. The third example is an example of co-development. This is an example from the uh, 2015 Brigham Hackathon. Um, there was a team uh, called Herald Health um, of uh, resident physicians and students from the Boston area that wanted to try to improve the efficiency of clinicians retrieving data from the EHR. And currently, if I'm seeing a patient, um, let's see, if I'm in the ED, I'm seeing a patient with chest pain. One of the common tests I order is a troponin. Uh, it's a blood test. It's very um, sensitive and specific if someone's having a heart attack. So I go in, I see the patient, I order the blood test, and then I check back in the computer every hour um, to see if the results have come back. Well, what Herald Health wants to do is um, empower the clinician to decide how they want to receive that information. Shouldn't it be pushed to me when it's available? So through Herald Health, I can set up customized rules to be notified. So I can use Herald to set up a rule that says, please notify me by my pager or my secure messaging solution or my email um, when the troponin is back. I might also set up a rule that says only notify me if the troponin is abnormal. And so uh, we've uh, signed a co-development agreement with Herald. Um, they have integrated with our electronic systems and we should be getting a pilot with our medical residents over the next several weeks. Brian Mullen has been leading the third um, component of the iHub, which is really focused on enabling and facilitating internal innovation. The first component is a studio, which provides um, high-level support of the culture of innovation with digital health tools. We hold networking events, we offer resources, and coaching. But for a small number of very high-potential, high-impact ideas, we have an accelerator. We provide some seed funding, we help them with prototyping, and we even help with business development. And I want to share a couple examples of, of, of our open uh, innovation studio. The first is from Dr. Heidi Shafi, um, called Fertilex. And as you know, uh, infertility is a common problem uh, affecting uh, many of us. Um, and actually, um, half the time, infertility is actually due to a problem on the, by the man. Um, and you may imagine this is, um, uh, it, it's uh, awkward for me to talk about this, but it's actually even more awkward as a man to try to get a sperm test, which is actually the first step in the diagnostic workup of infertility for males. So the current status is the man has to go in to a laboratory or to an office uh, to give a sample and have the test. Well, Dr. Shafi's research group is working to design, test, and validate a point-of-care sperm analysis test. And the iHub is involved to help with the digital health component, to figure out how can smart devices help with this analysis. Um, 
and we are excited uh, to, uh, you know, to help them um, hopefully advance this work, prove these methods, and lead to commercialization. The second example is Dr. Alex Lin, who started a company called BrainSpec. He's an MR spectroscopist. Um, MR spectroscopists um, are able to use MRIs, but actually look at metabolic changes in the tissues. And Alex's research has identified um, a metabolic pattern uh, in the data that's um, very sensitive and specific to identify a particular type of brain tumor. So he can run an analysis on an MR um, spectroscopy of a brain image and actually tell you whether or not the patient has a particular brain tumor. The challenge is his group does that in a research lab, and it can take days to run, the, run his analysis. So the iHub got involved, put together an inter interdisciplinary team, and is creating a digital interface that would allow this test to be performed at the point of care where the radiologist is there, offer decision support to the radiologist so they can use the MR spectroscopy and this analysis and algorithm that, that this group has come up with to help make the diagnosis. And um, a company has been formed, um, and they just applied for uh, federal grant uh, funding. As you can see, I hope you're seeing, AMCs have the ability to catalyze digital health innovation. I am really pleased to share with you today and announce a partnership between the Brigham and Women's Hospital and Evidation Health. As you know, Brigham and Women's brings uh, a large group of expert clinicians and researchers. Evidation Health brings a network of pharmaceutical companies, payers, uh, providers, and digital health companies. But they also bring expertise and a set of tools that enable direct-to-patient clinical trials of digital health apps. And we are so excited to partner with them to increase the evidence base for digital health apps, and hopefully we'll be back to share some of those results in the future. Um, we're also pleased to share, and if any of you are sticking around in the Boston area, we would love for you to come visit us. Um, the Brigham just opened a brand new building, the Building for Transformative Medicine, and we have space allocated for our innovation hub, and we welcome all of you to come uh, see us and get to know us uh, better. Um, while I'm speaking today, uh, the incredible work that you've just heard about is being done by a very gifted, talented, and dedicated team. Many of them are here today, so please introduce yourselves, talk to them, we're excited to, uh, to meet with you. So I hope that I've um, convinced you that AMCs uh, have a role to catalyze digital health innovation, and we look forward to working with you. Thanks. Any questions, or I've convinced everybody? Back. I might ask you one, but we don't have time. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you, Adam. Another hand for Adam, please. Adam Lynn. And then, okay. So now we have come to a very auspicious time in the program. We have all these uh, wonderful assistants up here. So this is time uh, for the raffle, okay? So all of you, many of you, filled out these passports. You brought them to all the wonderful exhibitors. And uh, those of you who finished the passports, we will enter the raffle. So now we're going to have uh, this exciting prize giveaway. Yep. Um, and I'm going to tell you special thanks to our sponsors, Cognizant, Inner Systems, Muse, Philips, and Spire. We'd also like to thank Muse, Spire, and Withings for providing products uh, for the raffle. Uh, other prizes include products from Finney, Finnis? Finney. Finney, yeah, I got it right the first time. Finney, uh, Garmin, and Jarman. Jar that says Jarman. Jar Garmin. Right, Jarman. <laughs> Jarman. <laughs> Jarman. <laughs> Jarman. Jabra, sorry. Okay, so, uh, so let's do this uh, raffle now. So. Did okay. you already draw the, do the drawing? You're going to do the drawing. Oh. I'm going to call out the product. So the first prize wait, is... Wait, wait. Venmo me if you want to win. Just send me some money. <laughs> All right. Jabra Sports Pulse Wireless Buds with in-ear heart rate monitoring. All right. I got it here. And... Let's see. We, oh, it's down at the bottom. Oops. Okay. There you want to read it? No, you can read it. Go ahead. This is uh, Helen Henricks. Helen. Give it up for Helen. Give me this. Yep. Okay, we're doing another one. All right. Second prize is a Garmin wristwatch that monitors heart rate and sends notifications to your smartphone. Oh my God, it's blank. I swear to God. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, whoever Mr. Blank is. <laughs> Why'd you miss? Wow. 
That's like, like doing that exam and you really nailed it and you forgot to write your name on it. Okay, okay, we got one with a name. That's good. I can't read it. Okay, glasses help. Okay. Give me some, I need some help here. This Diane says, Mahoney. Di Diane Mahoney? Yeah, yeah, Diane Mahoney. Is there a Diane Mahoney here? Diane Mahoney, I'm looking for you. I'll take that. Yep, she wanted me to take it. Oh, she's coming? <laughs> okay, yay, Diane. Save time, I'll do the next drawing while we're doing that. Thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations, Diane. Uh, Edward Mahoney. Oh my goodness. There wasn't the last like one on Mahoney? This kind of happened yesterday. Oh my God. Edward Mahoney, come on up, Edward. And this is a Spire Mindfulness Activity Tracker. All right. Really need to dig in there. <laughs> How many more do we have? Just one? Congrats. One more prize, guys. This is really exciting. Okay, this is for a Withings Body Cardio Heart Health and Body oh. Composition Wi Fi oh, scale. Okay. <laughs> so, first of all, I need a drum roll because this is the last. Oop, I lost it. This is the last prize, so I need a little bit of a drum roll from media people. Did I? Oh, there was the other one. <laughs> okay, it is for the grand prize, Margie Seip. All right. Margie, where are you? We can't clap for you if we don't see you. Come on, where are you? Hey, Margie, there she is. This is heavy. You want me to put There you go. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Thank you. All right, now we've done that. Uh, I've done that. That's good. Okay, so now we're going to lead you into a transition. We're going to have uh, several things going on starting at 2.05, which is in about uh, 15 minutes. Um, let me tell you what's going on. Here on the Commonwealth stage, we have the Partners Connected Health Innovation Challenge. So that certainly will be exciting. And then in the amphitheater, we have As We Age. Some of us do. As We Age, leverage, leveraging technologies to live better, live longer, live healthier. And then in the waterfront room, we have Connected Health, a long-term view. And finally, in the Beacon Hill room, we have Contrast and Compare, Contrast and Compare, Connected Health in Europe, ahead of or behind the US. I hear some trash talking coming. All right, so we're gonna break. 2.05 is, uh, is when everything starts. Great.